Vinod, thank you for joining us. So you wrote an economist piece just like a few hours ago that went up. What did you say in it? Did it get the result you wanted? And what did you leave out that was even more provocative that you didn't want to poke the bear or whatever? I did do an economist piece, and I did a longer version of that a year ago that talks about my thesis, that what we need is only a dozen or so real deep technical breakthroughs to solve the climate crisis. And if we don't get those breakthroughs, we don't solve it, no matter what everybody else on the planet does. Now, everybody can um, try to do one of those breakthroughs, but I think there'll be 12 instigators that cause change in the 12 large carbon-emitting industries uh, to happen. A good example by what I mean is we were not on a path to do uh, electric vehicles till Elon Musk came along. And not only did he start Tesla and prove that it was an economic model, he f literally forced every other major automotive maker, none of whom were doing anything much, to move to electric and recently to electric only, mostly. So that's an instigator. Nobody was doing uh, anything about emissions in agriculture. And Pat Brown came along and said, meat can taste, plant-based meats can taste just as good as regular meat. And uh, as he hopes, eventually, soon, better than plant, uh, the real thing. That means people actually prefer it. And I think uh, that's an instigator, too. Now, there's a number of industries that are critical. Um, they're well recognized um, that we need instigators in. You know, aviation fuel, sustainable aviation fuel is one of those. And hopefully, uh, we have a company called Lance Attack. Uh, hopefully, Jennifer there will be the instigator to get everybody on the path. Now, we can do electric planes which will be very short range for at least the next 20 years that we can see, if not forever. We can do hydrogen planes, but changing trillions of dollars of airplanes is going to be very hard, and that's okay to attempt. I'm not against any attempts, but a much easier path will be if we have a jet fuel that's 100% renewable, that fits into current planes, which is what Lanza Attack is doing. The same is true in cement. For Terra, one of our companies, re-equipping old cement plants to produce low-carbon cement and eventually zero-carbon cement. I think that'll happen. That'd be pretty fabulous thing if we can retrofit old plants. Uh, my favorite is right there in Boston, Commonwealth Fusion a newer clean tech investment that we've made that hopes that it can repower existing coal and natural gas plants. So one of the points I made in my economist op-ed is let's keep them running and just replace their boilers when the technology is ready. Solar and wind is great technology up to a point, but it doesn't need all our needs and it's silly for people to say it does. Um, in fact, I've argued controversially that we should stop doing subsidies in solar and wind because they make economic sense today, what I call unsubsidized market competitiveness for their purpose, for what it's used. But I, I think you need things like fusion or deep, the geothermal to really have uh, dispatchable power uh, power when we uh, that's available when we need it, not just when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we have solar investments too because it's a good market and it's a great place for entrepreneurs to play. So that's for starters. Uh, I do think many of the subsidies are being wasted on solar, on wind, even electric cars. They're going to happen now. We need subsidies probably for charging stations, but not electric cars. We ought to subsidize the breakthrough technologies that make steel low carbon 
and economic at the same time. So there's a dozen such areas that I talked about in the Economist top ad in my piece from a year ago uh, called uh, It Only Takes a Dozen Instigators to Make This Change Happen. Doesn't happen because of rah-rah optimism or saying everybody can participate, you know, using one sheet of toilet paper instead of two, like a famous actress once said, that's not going to make a difference. And we should stop wasting our time and step, stop pretending on those things. So, Vinod, you, you've been an investor for a while. I know you're just getting started. You're like 25. Can you tell us, how do you view clean tech 1.0 versus clean tech 2.0? What, what are the differences and why are you uh, hopeful? Some people call uh, clean tech 1.0 as, as a kind of failed era. Look, clean tech 1.0 wasn't a failed era. What we got was the thing to keep in mind is technologies take their time and how investors value them doesn't matter uh, in whether something's a boom or a bust. Uh, there was a bust in the internet in 1998 that didn't affect internet traffic, the real usage of the internet. Valuations in the market got busted but what really happened with clean tech 1.0 is it took a long time. You know, we invested in QuantumScape back then. It's going to be a great return. It's already a public company, multi-billion dollars, great return for us. But it took far longer than I imagined. Lanza Tech Sustainable Aviation Fuel was a clean tech 1.0 investment that took a very long time because the, mark, the world wasn't ready are caring about sustainable aviation fuels. Impossible Foods, we invested in 2010. Great return today, but, but took a long time to do it right and actually build a technology that will be better than uh, regular meat and regular chicken. So my contention, at least for us, if you were patient and stayed with it and didn't abandon it, like a lot of investors, they came in, in a boom cycle and then went out as soon as cycle went away. We stayed with it. And I think very good technologies came out of clean tech 1.0. And in fact, if you invested in Tesla, for example, you'd be doing fine at any valuation that you entered in. And that's a great example of a clean tech 1.0 thing. And the nature of venture capital is one out of 40 investments will return a fund or do multiples of a fund. They're very asymmetric in their return profile. So 95% of what you do can fail and still get a great return. And that has been true of clean tech 1.0, but with the additional complication that it took a long time and people didn't have the patience to stick through it. But people who stuck through it and had good investments and good judgment did fine, and clean tech 1.0 was fine for us. Clean tech 2.0 is also exciting. So I, I don't know if I'm telling you anything you don't know, but you're one of the top one percent, and you know you've been on the Fortune Forbes list. Um, there was a big transfer of wealth. Uh, um, there's a lot, a lot of very wealthy families, and government can only do so much. Foundations, corporations, with this wealth uh, going to a lot of uh, uh, families, what role do you think they should play at this time? And, you know, I, whenever I'm with you, I see your wife and your kids, and I, I kind of I get the feeling you're a unit and you guys are uh, collaborating on some of the stuff. You're not saying we all should cut down on toilet paper. You're saying that we should back a few people. But what role should the 1% of 1% of 1% play here? Well, you know, there's p people, uh, both wealthy and other institutional investors, investing in solar and wind and scaling projects that have already made uh, economic sense. And they should keep doing that. You know, more money deployed between solar and wind is good. I don't think it's the best use of government money because solar and wind don't need subsidies. And, uh, uh, ethanol doesn't need subsidies. That's a boondoggle that should be shut down. 
But newer technologies like uh, aviation fuels do need subsidies uh, from the government. So wealthy people or, into, uh, or institutional investors will make market competitive rates in clean technologies that are ready to be massively scaled. And there's quite a few of them and they should keep funding that. But where the real solution lies, what's missing and that what won't happen without some in, uh, intervention and instigators like I talked about, entrepreneurs hopefully in the audience, what won't happen is these breakthrough technologies. These are high risk. They take a lot of effort. And um, my hope is that the more and more people will be willing to take those risks and fund these technologies. So you have a larger than life reputation. Uh, what's your legacy going to be on uh, clean tech? You know, I, I, my religion is technology, so uh, I don't worry about legacies. I, I do think it's a lot of fun to work on these really hard problems. You know, whether it's cement or aviation fuel, we are working on public transit of all things. You know, Commonwealth fusion could potentially change the world. Quays, which is, I think, at your conference, in geo super hot rock geothermal, which is the only kind of geothermal that matters. Really exciting technologies, hard problems. Uh, there's not only a lot of reward in working on these hard problems, there's a lot of wealth to be created in working on these hard problems. Hydrogen is a good one. High temperature industrial heat, that's a big problem. We have multiple approaches to, we are working on uh, both hydrogen and other ways to get high temperature heat, which is not possible typically from electric power or solar power. We're trying to say, can we convert solar into high temperature heat? Long duration storage is another good one. What's something that you know that none of us know that we should know? I think more is possible than people think if we do them the right way. So one example, if Commonwealth Fusion was building brand new plants, if geothermal quays was building brand, brand new plants, it'd take a lot longer than if they retro replace, just replaced coal boilers in existing places. And whether you're geothermal or fusion or that's a good strategy. Uh, doesn't always work. In electric cars, it didn't work. That would be a really good one that people don't pay attention to. If you could use existing airplanes, uh, trillions of dollars worth of flying airplanes that have 50-year lives, that would be great. I think that's something that doesn't get enough focus. So repurposing infrastructure, and I will tell you, all the pundits who say it takes trillions and trillions of dollars fundamentally have no notion of what technology can do. I think most of the pundits like Vaclav Smell are just fundamentally wrong in not understanding the nature of exponentials. He would have said that about electric cars in 2015. In fact, well, one of the funniest stories I have is the Department of Energy talked to all the experts uh, and predicted in 2035, a 25-year forecast, there'd be a certain number of cars which Elon and Tesla alone exceeded in 2015 or 2016. So my one piece of advice to everybody in the audience, ignore the experts, don't believe when they tell you what can and can't be done. In fact, there's no expert who ever innovated in the area. They just extrapolated the past, not invented a new future, which is what we need here. So my message to entrepreneurs, you can do more than you think you can do and go for inventing the future you want, not what experts are talking about. Great. Well, Vinod, we're going to do this annually. Love for you. We dare you to send us some ideas to put on our stage. We want to create the Oscars of uh, actual ideas for climate change. And we want to not extrapolate the past, but innovate the future. And we want you to be part of it. Do you, do you accept that? Let me give you two crazy ones that people say can't be done. You know, uh, just to stimulate your imagination, and these might fail. So let me be clear. Our failure rate is high, and I'm fine with it. A 90% chance of failure is okay if there's a 10% chance of changing the world. But we are making fertilizer, which is a major carbon emitter, 
the Hibba Bosch process by out of thin air, literally solar panels uh, convert, uh, converted into a plasma to a gyrotron, convert nitrogen from the air and water into nitric acid, which is fertilizer. So literally we produce fertilizer with no inputs. That's a great one. There's another attempt we are doing where uh, iron ore falls through and lasers uh, uh, together with hydrogen converted into iron. So steel making becomes a very different. Pro- These are crazy ideas, more likely to fail than not. But if they were, they're transformative of very, very large industries. And that's why your audience should be focused on that. Um, I, you know, and frankly, I'll give you a message. Half the things I looked at in talks, I would have said they're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, not working on climate, even if they claim they are. But I won't take more of your time. Thank you, everybody.